Greetings from Mount Holly First United Methodist Church. We're so glad to have you worshiping with us. We've been doing this series of Where in the World is Pastor Mike? And so today, I'm up in Pennsylvania, Marion, Pennsylvania, where I was born and raised. This is a field in the backyard where the farmer is taking the straw and putting them into huge bales. We hope to have you comment your name and join this worship service where we get to worship God, worship our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ through the music and through the word that is read and the word that is preached. I hope and pray that it be a blessing to you and to everyone that you meet. Take care and God bless. Bye-bye. For this day, we're gathered in your name, calling out to you. Your glory like a fire, awakening desire, will burn our hearts with truth. You're the reason we're here. You're the reason we're singing. Open up the to open up the heavens today and show us his presence, his greatness, his glory. Do you remember the day that you came to know him? The day that your sins were forgiven? What a glorious day it was. Let's continue worshiping with this. I was buried beneath my shame 
who could carry that kind of weight. It was my tune till I met you. I was breathing but not alive. All my failures I tried to hide. It was my doom till I met you. You called my name And I ran out of that grave Out of the darkness Into your glorious day You called my name And I ran out of that grave Out of the darkness And now your mercy has saved my soul And now your freedom is all that I know You know why? The old may do Jesus, when I met you When you called my name Into your glorious day You called my name And I ran out of that grave Out of the darkness Into your glorious day I want you to think about how it was before you came to know him. I needed rescue, my sin was heavy, the chains break at the weight of your glory. I needed shelter, I was an orphan, now you call me a citizen of heaven. When I was broken, you were my healing, now you're day it was when we came to know him. Let's continue worshiping as Pete comes. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to uh, our impact service on this Independence Day weekend, uh, July the 5th. As we come to this place, we remember those who have given the ultimate sacrifice that we can be in this place at this time to honor our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ and also be with the families that have lost loved ones this year. Because of COVID-19, we need to keep them in our prayers. And uh, before we start, uh, let us go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, we thank you for this day, and Father, we just thank you for every day. We are not guaranteed tomorrow, but Father, we know if something happens, we will be in your loving arms. 
Father, we pray for those that need your healing touch. And Father, we also pray for those that are in the hospitals uh, that need to be cured, Father. And Father, we just uh, also lift up the families that have lost loved ones this year. And Father, we know that you will give them strength every day to carry on. And Father, thank you for the wonderful memories that they are a part of. And Father, um, also as we go through this change, we Father, we rejoice because we know you never change. Father, you are uh, the great I am. And Father, your disciples many, many years ago asked, Jesus, how do we pray? And Jesus said this, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And also as we come to this time of giving, I personally thank everyone in this church, and I know Mike, and everyone in the staff of this church welcomes the gifts that you have given, not only monetarily, but also of yourself. And I love when Mike says, jump in the baskets because it's all about what you do. And amen.
7 verses 15 through 25 and I'll be stopping at the first part of verse 25. This is the New Living Translation. Paul begins, I don't understand myself at all, for I really want to do what is right, but I don't do it. Instead, I do the very thing I hate. I know perfectly well that what I am doing is wrong, and my bad conscience shows that I agree that the law is good, but I can't help myself. Because it is sin inside of me that makes me do these evil things. I know that I am rotten through and through, so far as my old sinful nature is concerned. No matter which way I turn, I can't make myself do it. I want to, but I can't. When I want to do good, I don't. And when I try not to do wrong, I do it anyway. But if I am doing what I don't want to do, I'm not really the one doing it. The sin within me is doing it. It seems to be a fact of life that when I want to do what is right, I inevitably do what is wrong. I love God's law with all my heart, but there is another law at work within me that is at war with my mind. This law wins the fight. And makes me a slave to the sin that is still within me. Oh, what a miserable person I am. Who will free me from this life that has dominated by sin? Thank God. The answer is Jesus Christ, our Lord. For this is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Gracious God, as this living word has been read to us this day, may it be something that we read over and over again and look deep within each word that Paul writes and that we resonate with it, especially this one where he is struggling with his sinful nature. We are all sinners in a desire to know Jesus Christ as our Lord and our Savior to understand his sacrificial love upon that cross for us. May we read these words as it feeds our heart and our soul. May we come with a hunger and thirst to grow in our relationship, to reaffirm our relationship, and maybe get back in a right relationship to know that Jesus Christ is the answer to our struggles, is an answer to the sin that seems to swallow us whole. And the lamb, the sacrificial lamb of Jesus, that is the word of God made flesh through God's only son, may it speak to us today through the power of the Holy Spirit that we have ears to hear, remove all distractions from us, and may the words of my mouth be pleasing upon you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. We all struggle with inner conflicts and temptations and things. Even your pastor struggles with inner conflicts. And this week, I have an example of an inner conflict that I faced in my own house. Take a look at this video and you see where I struggled. Hey Mike, I bought some Oreos for us to take to eat on our trip on the way to see your mom and dad. Don't eat any. I don't know if we need to have a support group here in our church where we say, my name is Mike Carr, I struggle with eating Oreo cookies too much. Um, And it's my reason of why I work out so many times during the week is so that I can eat those Oreo cookies, maybe three or four at a time. Um, But 
then you shut the, the cabinet door. Or you have a wonderful spouse like I do who keeps on me going, Mike, do you really need to eat those? Mike, do you really need to eat those? And so, Lord, lead me not in temptation or give me a spouse that keeps me from that temptation. But it's also one of those things, if you don't go and buy any Oreo cookies at the grocery store, then they can't be calling your name from the cabinet or the pantry. Some other internal conflicts that we are facing even to this day is maybe about our worship services. You know, do you uh, attend, you know, this 832 service here in the fellowship hall at, with our wonderful praise band? Or do you attend the 1055 service upstairs in the sanctuary because you love the choir and the organ playing? It's those type of things that we face on a regular basis. Maybe it's the conflict of do we wear a mask or not wear a mask? Is it the fact of, you know, do we like to root for Duke or do we root for the other team of Carolina? I think it's so funny to see flags on the outside of people's houses. And you show one part of the flag is of Duke and the other flag is of that other school of Carolina. And it says a house divided. It's really not a house divided. It's one person in that house that really knows who the winning team is and the other person is just really lost and confused. And so now that I've got your attention, and we really are missing sports. We didn't get to have the ACC tournament and the, the NCAA tournament and baseball and basketball. All those things are delayed, and some of them have been canceled. But we so desperately are struggling with this conflict of stay at home, go out. What do we do? What do we not do? And we are struggling with a conflict right now because of this sickness and this virus. But this scripture passage, Paul is talking to us about a real conflict that all of humanity faces. It is a conflict of reality of our sin that dates clear back to the beginning of time of Adam and Eve. And the conflict that they were facing of was being like God. And then they ate from that one tree that God told them not to eat. And we all would say, if we were in the Garden of Eden, if we were with Adam and Eve, and God told us not to eat from that tree, we all would have listened, right? No. We all would have fell into that same temptation to be like God. Every single day of our lives, we have a desire to be like God. And it's not so much being like God that Paul is facing. It is his struggle with his past. It's the sinful nature of his life that he begins to know that all the things that he thought he was doing was right, going around and arresting and persecuting those early Christians, thinking that what they were doing and what they were saying was against God. And he was even commanding some of them to be stoned to death for their belief in Jesus Christ. And God turned his life upside down that Saul became Paul, one of the greatest evangelists of all time. And here in the book of Romans, he's just laying it all out there. It was hard for me to read this and put the I in there because it made me begin to think about myself, that I don't understand myself at all. For I really want to do what is right, but I don't do it. How many of us struggle with that? We know what the right thing to do is, but there's something inside of us that makes us do the wrong. It's like sometimes with, not with action, but with the words of our mouth. The, the wrong things come out way too fast. We don't think before we speak. And then once it's come out, we're like, uh-oh, now what do we do? That didn't sound too much like a Christian. The anger, the frustration, the person who cut us off, my big pet peeves is getting lost and being late. And interesting enough, those two things happened to me today. I got off the wrong exit, I got lost, and then I was late for an appointment. And the things that I was thinking, the things and frustration that was coming out of my mouth was not of a good pastoral thing. It was anger, it was frustration. And I have a little girl in the back seat going, hey, it's about the love of Jesus. You need to think about loving Jesus. And I was like, she's right. Why can't I think about Jesus when all this anger and frustration is coming over me? And we got to the appointment, not on time, we were late, but it wasn't that big a deal. And we get so wound up when people press our buttons, right? When people on social media say certain things and we get all wound up because they have said something that offends us. They have said something that angers us. 
And we're allowing all these things to divide us and allow the sin, the sinful nature to kind of appear. And we begin to realize that we are not that sinful nature anymore. Where is the nature and the love, the mercy, and the grace of Jesus Christ living in us? And he's almost saying that this is impossible. I'm not just struggling with this inner conflict, but this inner conflict owns me. I am a slave to sin. And he says, oh, what a miserable person I am. Who will free me from this life that is dominated by sin? And then a light bulb goes off. It's a realization where he says, thank God. The answer is in Jesus Christ, our Lord, who is our Lord and our Savior, who forgives us of our sins. It isn't when you mess up, or if you mess up, it's when you mess up. And then when you mess up, that's when you own it, and you say, you know what, I've done wrong. And I had to say this to Kelly and me and say, you know what, I'm the one that made the wrong turn. I'm the one that's making us late. Will you forgive me? Forgive me of what I said. Forgive me of my anger and my frustrations. Will you forgive me? You see, asking for forgiveness of who we've done the wrongs to makes us more of a Christian than trying to be perfect because no one is perfect. The only person that was ever perfect was Jesus Christ, God's only son. And yes, we're supposed to be like Christ. Yes, we're supposed to be striving for Christian perfection. But we all fall short of that every single day. And we say, Lord, forgive me of my trespasses as I forgive those who trespassed against me. My brothers and sisters, it is not complicated. This inner conflict, this battle that we have in our mind, in our heart, in our soul, we have to stand up today and say, you know what? No longer will I fight this battle because whenever I fight this battle, I fall short every single time. And so when I think about the fight and the fight that Jesus puts up for me, he's already won the battle. And so if he's already won the battle, then I don't need to fight the conflict anymore. He's already won through his death and resurrection and that sin no longer controls me and that I can kind of just shake it off. The blood of Jesus washes away all the sin and makes us whole again. And if you don't know that today, you can proclaim the victory in Jesus. You can proclaim that there is victory, not by what you've done, but what Jesus has done for you. And we have to proclaim it today, tomorrow, and every single day. And to know that this inner conflict has already been won. Paul shares this scripture passage of saying this is where he's coming from. Here's his inner struggles. Here is the struggle with sin. Here's the inner conflict that he's battling in his heart and his soul. But the realization comes with this. Thank you, God. The answer is in Jesus Christ, our Lord. And everything that we face, every conflict that we come in to battle, we have to realize that Jesus Christ goes before us and defeats all the battles, defeats all the conflicts, and he is the way, the truth, and the life, and we will follow him every step of the way. And sin no longer has control over me. You say it, in the name of Jesus Christ, sin does not dominate you. Sin does not claim you that you are a child of God and that you claim Jesus Christ as your Lord and your Savior, and sin no longer has a sting. Death has been swallowed up in victory because of Jesus Christ. And we know where our eternal home is. It's not here on this earth, but it's with Jesus in the heavens. And until he calls us home, my brothers and sisters, we have work to do. No longer should we be struggling but we should be asking us ourselves this question. Do you want to resolve the inner conflict in your life? Do you want to resolve the inner conflict in your soul? Do you want to resolve the inner conflict in your heart? Your life, your soul, and your heart. Jesus has resolved all of that conflict. If you will just give your life to Jesus, if you will just fall at the foot of the cross, 
and claim Jesus Christ as your Lord and your Savior. And know that death, because the consequences of sin is death. We are all sinners. We all deserve to have eternal death. But God wants to be with you and with me for eternity. He wants to give us eternal life. That's why he's given his only son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross for all the world's sins. And for those who would believe in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. Do you want that today? Do you want to proclaim Jesus Christ as your Lord and your Savior? And that you can go and tell others that the internal conflict of sin and doing what is right, turning your back to sin and repenting of your sins and turning towards God, you can do that today. Every day is an opportunity, every moment is an opportunity to turn away from sin and turn towards God. That's why it's amazing grace. Because there's nothing you can do to earn it. It's just there offered to you. Let us pray. Gracious God, we thank you for the honesty of Paul here in Romans chapter 7. Where he just lays his soul out on the pages for all those that read that scripture passage, could begin to say, you know what? When he's talking about himself, I can hear the I being myself. That we all struggle with this internal conflict of sin. There's at times where we feel like sin has claimed us, but we know that we have Jesus Christ. That we can say, thanks be to God, that Jesus is the answer. And that I am no longer dominated. I am no longer a slave to sin because Jesus Christ died on the cross for my sins. Open up the door to your heart and your soul and proclaim it in your life today, tomorrow, and forevermore. And to know that your sins are forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are free from all the sins of your past, that sin no longer claims you. The devil and Satan no longer has a hold on you because you are in the arms of Jesus. And nothing can snatch you from the hand of Jesus. And no longer will you turn towards sin. But every single day, you will turn towards the light of Christ because Jesus lives in your heart, in your soul. And because of Jesus, the conflict has been resolved in your life, in your heart, and in your soul from this day forward. We thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name.
As we leave this place today, remember God gives us the ultimate power. As we focus on what he does through us, we can do anything. God is in control and everything's going to be all right. Go out this week, touch someone for God. He's touched you. He wants you to touch someone for him. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.